Every once in a while, a cartoonist comes along that uh, kind of looks at the medium from a different angle. And uh, today my guest is Sam J. Royale, and uh, he certainly does that. Uh, graphic designer by day, he uses multimedia uh, to sort of piece together his stories in really unique and interesting ways. So today we're going to take a look at his new book, Pariah. Before we get started, don't forget to sign up to my Patreon, where you can see my work as it's being created, and uh, serialized comics as well as physical rewards. Welcome to Chris Anderson Comics. Um, so the first book, Sam, that you put out it, mm -hmm. was Dishoom. There's actually two issues yes. of this, right? Yeah, so there's one and two here. Tell me about this one real quick. Oh, wow. You have that? Oh, my God. That's yeah, wild. Man. Okay. Uh, so Hammer of the Gods uh, was the first uh, paying comic job I had as a, a colorist and background painter. And so there's this yeah. company, HOTG Toys, uh, run by Walter Harris, where he does custom toys, custom action figures and he uh he hired this really talented artist alan j shell to do the pencils and inks and then he hired me to do yeah. the colors and background paintings and what he wanted to do was he wanted to emulate a 1980s um fire and ice or masters of the universe style yes. uh uh animated feel where it's like a book made from stills from the animation and um it was a lot of fun to work on uh and you can see from the the artwork that alan did i mean he's a, he's a very talented guy and walter himself he wrote the book and um yeah it was just this really cool thing like uh walter sold it to us like imagine if carl weathers had this like barbarian like this b-grade barbarian movie franchise built around him and then it got adapted into a cartoon and then that cartoon got copied and pasted and chopped up into a comic book. Yeah. And so that's where we were at here. And um, yeah, it was super fun to work on this, but it was really uh, time consuming. So I was actually working on Dishoom one uh, when Walter contacted me and then uh, I just put it on hold for, I think like two years <laughs> to work on this sure. because like it was supposed to be 40 pages and then it got, up to 60 pages, I think. And um, it was just very labor intensive work. And I moved further away from the office at that time. So I only had like 25 minutes a day to work on it. So it took forever Whoa. to finish. But um, yeah, I'm really proud of how it came out though. And uh, it was it was a joy. Really, it was really, yeah. it was really cool to like, uh, to work with Alan on it because like, he, by coincidence, hated drawing backgrounds. And so okay. like, it just worked out great. So like what was happening was like, he was, he was like forcing himself to like do these painstaking background drawings for like the first few pages. And then I found out he didn't even like doing it. I was like, you just leave them blank. I'll figure it out. And so like, as yeah. the book progresses, there's like less and less detail given to me in the pencils. And uh, yeah. I got a lot of leeway on it and it was really cool. And, um, and Walter, uh, Walter Harris gave us a lot of creative freedom. So like even the pages are showing right now where, um, mm where the character has that blue fur cloak. He did yeah. not give me direction, but apparently in his head, he imagined everything being very muted, very like Conan the Barbarian uh, movie, uh, you know, like browns and reds and warm colors. And, uh, but he didn't tell me that. And the, the scene was in the winter and I thought like, oh, it'd be really cool to give him this like super flashy blue fur fantasy creature pelt that he's wearing. Um, and he, so he like kind of, it kind of left him, Walter was like, what, what is this? Why is it blue? But then it grew on him, thankfully. And, uh, and then he, he let me, uh, kind of run wild with the colors. That's great. The book went on. I, I wanted to put this up here because <clears throat> I think people know that I'm a huge, you know, masses of the universe, uh, Mark. Right. And, um, I got this book from you because, because of how much I love like masses of the universe sort of adjacent things. And it's absolutely what it is. And your background paintings to the, you know, the flat coloring of the, um, of the, you know, foreground art, it just, it absolutely works just like 
just like it was supposed to. And I just thought it was brilliant. So I wanted to show people this oh, book, thanks. you know, a uh, total tangent. It's but it's funny how that works out too, though, because like Alan and I, we like butted heads initially because he was like, yeah, you can't color it so flat. You got to like, it really doesn't let my artwork sing. I was like, no, it has to be flat because these are static images. If I do too much like cell shading on the figures, it's going to merge with the background too much. And people aren't going to yeah. understand that these are characters layered on top of paintings. Exactly. And, uh, I don't know. I think I just argued enough that I got my way, but yeah, I think he's happy with the end result. Oh man, I <laughs> I hope that he is because it's it's brilliant. Um, the first time I came across your work was when we were sort of it was lockdown time and we were all working on this image grand design project. Um, right, it came together and you were kind of like a standout artist because you oh, were kind of known as the guy who drew with whatever the hell you could find, <laughs> be it you know uh, chalk or crayon or yeah. you know anything. In fact, like here's a little colored pencil sketch that you you gave me when you you sent me this first issue of Deshoom. Deshoom has two issues out. It is a um, it, it's an anthology of stories, and right. you can see like the way that you you do it. Like you use all sorts of media, right? Yeah, um, like you said, kind of whatever's around. Um, Deshoom one, I was experimenting a lot. It's the first comic I made by myself. And uh, so I just wanted to see what worked best for me. And so that story that you're flipping through right now, like what was happening was like page one would be inked in Photoshop. And then the next page would be inked in Illustrator. Yeah. Then the next page would be done with actual ink on paper. And then like, I would just change it up every page just to see what I was comfortable with. And so I feel like yeah. um, issue one's a little more disjointed, but issue two, I really found like what worked for me. Um, and yeah. This story that you're flipping through, the Theo portal, the last story in issue one, I really went off the rails with process. Like it got to the point where it's like each panel was like done with different methods and materials. And um, you'll see, yeah, especially once you get here, once you get to the crayons and the ripped paper yeah. and the, the whiskey <clears throat> bottle. And yeah, there's a, a lot of stuff going on there. So your, um, your uh, Bruce Wayne by day job is uh, a graphic designer, yeah? Yeah, so I do advertising design for a publishing company, make ads for books. Right, so this was just sort of a way for you to come home and, and try storytelling and, and experiment with different ways and not have to not have to be glued to a computer and, and break out like traditional media and, and just play with it, right? To a point, yeah, but I end up doing a lot of finishing digitally anyway, so there's still sure. tons of computer time. But uh, yeah, yeah it's just... Uh, I always wanted to make a comic like, and I just always thought, Oh, one day I will. And I just kept putting it off and putting it off. And, uh, finally, uh, at 34, uh, the first book was done and now I'm 38 and I have a few books under my belt. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's crazy because all of a sudden the Deshoom two came out like, uh, like two, maybe two years later. Uh, something like that. Yeah. I think, yeah, this was 2020 yeah. and that was 2022. Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this appears. Nobody <laughs> knew it was coming. You worked completely in the dark on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, this is this pariah uh, number episodes one through five collected. So, well, tell me right. about tell me about this. So um, Pariah was a character I made up in college when I was like 19 or 20, so probably like 2005 or six around there. And uh, I always thought like, I'm going to do an anthology comic book and it's going to be called Pariah and it's going to be a square format. And then I don't know what happened somewhere along the lines. I just abandoned the character, the title, everything, and then did Dishoom instead. And all those stories in Dishoom were originally supposed to be in a book called Pariah. Um, so yeah, it, I don't know why I uh, got rid of the character, but I did. And then he came back to me in a dream uh, in 2021, where he, he uh, yeah, he screamed at me in a dream, uh, basically to get him out on paper again. And uh, and so I thought, yeah, maybe uh, you know, maybe he could do, maybe he could be in a strip format now. Maybe that's maybe that'll work. And so uh, I started playing around with that, and uh, just by coincidence or luck. Um, Instagram tends to favor square content and Pry was always planned to be in a square. So um, 
that just was a serendipitous thing. And um, yeah, so the character he's kind of like this barbarian thief, but it's kind of sword and planet kind of. It's a lot of between Pariah and Dishum. I'm not really good with uh, clearly defined genres. <laughs> So it's um it's sort of hard to sell. It's just like it is what it is. Um, flip through it if you like it. Cool. If you don't, oh well. But uh, it's hard to really pin down exactly. Uh, in terms it is, of genre. well, I'll tell you just first off the bat. It the book itself just in, in the way it's presented and your and your design sense is just a beautiful piece of art. Like well, from thanks. start to finish. You know the formatting. You know like did did you just say, you know, I want it to be in a square format just because I want it to look a little bit different from like other books or was that there must... a reason for it or, or was it part of your dream? Because that seems to be, the dream thing is weird because it seems to be a theme with a lot of guests that I've had on recently. And it's oh, also yeah? something that's happened to me where it's just like, that's where it comes and then you mold it afterwards. Yeah, you know, I actually wanted to talk to you about that a little because I, I was watching your... Um your Katie Skelly episode, and you said that you were working on a comic project where you're following the muse uh, wherever she may take you. And I sort of let that yeah. happen with this book as well. And and then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you privately had mentioned like the Tom Waits quote on the New York Times interview where he talked about writing or creativity in general, comparing it to like a seance or conjuring. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that clicked with me too. So I thought uh, yeah. that might be interesting to talk to you about like in terms of process and stuff like how often do you work that way how often do you let it find its way into the work when do you ever ignore the voice <laughs> what do you do no i don't i don't ignore it i don't ignore it and you know i'm like i'm a, I'm a songwriter as well and the way that weights talks about all that stuff it really really spoke to me um because i'm not like a spiritual guy or anything like that but there is definitely some sort of like meditative trance that you get into when you're a, a creative person working on something and ideas just Close. kind of flow. The, the, the craziest time for it to happen to me is when I'm like the calmest is when I wake up first thing in the morning and I get in the shower and I'm not even awake yet, that all of a sudden these things will start to come. And I, I, I have found the best thing to do is listen to that. I don't have to have an, a reason why. I just do it and it almost always tends to work out and, and I'll find other ways to connect it together whether it be a melody or a, a story idea um, or a way to work, it just seems to be like these gifts from the, from the ether that are like floating around and you like pl pluck them out and you can, you know, put them on the table and, and, and utilize them or you can let them go and, and wait until the next one comes. But, you know, they're always floating around. Yeah, well, that's true. And I see, I, I have ignored it before. And yeah. I found I found that when you ignore it, they, they just come back louder and louder until it's like this character where he literally screamed at me. Like you can't really shake them. <laughs> like they, it's yeah. gonna find its way back to you anyways. You know, like I There's abandoned Pariah for yeah. Dishum and Pariah came back. But yeah, so this um page on the left here, where you see like that 90s style grunge typography, graphic yeah. design stuff, that was um the inspiration behind that was people like David Carson and, and um, Chris Ashworth, who, who did like that, um, really pioneered that grunge graphic design. I think that was really prevalent in the 90s. Um, they were both art directors for Raygun magazine, um, and you know, which is like a, kind of an infamous thing among graphic designers because so uh, David Carson, he was a professional surfer first and didn't have a graphic design background. And then he just decided to start dabbling. And yeah. Yeah. so his stuff just looked so unique uh, compared to everything else that was out at the time. And there was, a, in Raygun Magazine, there was an interview with Brian Ferry and he thought it was really boring. So he just set the whole interview in Zaf Dingbats. So you can't read it. It's like, yeah, it's not worth yeah. reading anyway. And so that's just the kind of guy he is. And um, so, yeah, like I was, uh, I was kind of an admirer of, uh, of his work. And uh, it's sort, sort of around punk aesthetic, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of what like you... ripping things up, taping it back together. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Man, I, your graphic design sense is amazing. I don't have a grasp on it. I don't really understand how design works that way, especially with typography and stuff. And it's just the way that you do it is just beautiful. Um, and then, you know, you juxtapose it with this, with your like um, traditional media stuff. What are you using when you are drawing like this image here? Oh God, that one, I'm not even, there might be a colored pencil and marker sketch somewhere in this sketchbook of that figure. I, I jump around so much. Like some of these drawings are fully digital. Some are on really copier paper. Some are on brown paper. Yeah. I don't even, it's really bad. I don't even go in order, you know, like I open to a page and just start drawing. So you just and go, you just go, just go. Yeah. Cause like other, okay. my, my problem is I have a tendency to plan and over plan. And if I let myself go down that rabbit hole, I don't get anything done, which is why I didn't have any comics to show all through my twenties or anything. And so I really just had to stop thinking so much, but that overthinking that. always finds a way into, <laughs> so there's parts of it that are very overplanned, Yeah. Uh, and parts that are a little more uh, spontaneous. So yeah, yeah I don't yeah. remember that one of him crouching. I know for sure I drew on paper <laughs> some. <somewhere>. Okay. <laughs> Um, in, in like pencil and then you, and then you color it digitally or do you color it um, traditionally? Well, so even that, like I don't do pencils, inks, colors. It's just, right. I start with color. Like I start with colored pencil, I start with marker and then like I'll photograph it cause I, I don't have a scanner. So I photograph it with my phone and then I, uh, digitally paint on top of it in Photoshop and I don't have it in front of me. It's at the, um, it's at my in-laws house, but I have a, a walk tablet from it was it was outdated when i bought it in 2011 yeah and i still use that thing and so like if yeah, I, I update I, my laptop's operating system my whole operation shuts down <laughs> i had one from 1999 until a couple years ago oh wow that's impressive yeah. i don't know i don't know how it still worked it was it was wild yeah um, i mean just for the sake of like compatibility and, and things like that so uh, impressive yeah, I love how you just like, you know, everybody's kind of like, okay, how do I make comics? Well, you pencil it and then you ink it and then you scan it and then you color it and then you letter it. And then you just said, I don't, what? No, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to just go and do it however the hell it happens. It, that was part of it for sure. It was part of it was like a conscious decision to try to make something that looked different from the way other people were doing it. And the other part was I did take... Um, I took this uh, comics and sequential art illustration course in, in college and I learned very quickly, I suck at the traditional pipeline of doing things like the inking and stuff. It's just bad. Like I have so much respect for people who can do it that way because I just don't have it in me. Um, I love that it didn't some... deter you and that you were like, I'm still going to make comics. I'm just gonna, not going to make them that way. Well, yeah. It's like, I'm going to, it's, it's, if anything, a strength, like my books won't look like anyone else's books. Good. Yeah. You know? Love it. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is Pariah. We find that he's this guy, guy who just kind of appears and he's got an ax. So this is what we know of him. Yeah. He escaped from a, of a, from a, some sort of jail cell. Oh, I finally found it flipping through all these pages in the book. So there, oh, that was the yeah. original drawing of him crouching before all the if I can digital painting. That. Let me see if I can pull that there. So yeah, it's pretty crude. Cause like I knew I was going to fix it digitally it's a later. <laughs> uh, wow. Oh, and then here's the cover image you were asking. I did oh, yeah, draw him here. on paper. I didn't okay. realize. Yeah. But like even his build is built a little chunkier here. I, I slimmed him down digitally, I think. Wow. That is wild, man. All right, let's see here. Okay. So we're kind of introduced to him. Oh, here's this, him running away from prison. That's also in here. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And you, it's so small on this one. Right, yeah, I know all the details are going to be lost, but I don't have that ability to draw really tiny. So I just draw it knowing that I'm going to lose all the detail later. This is a trip. So, and, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, the stories, they kind of bounce all over the place. It's like, it's like a, 
a hallucination with a, with a thread. It's like, almost like, you know, you're like tripping balls and writing this. Um, uh, I actually don't indulge uh, in, in any kind of hallucinogens or anything like that, but- uh, Yeah, well, uh, you're, uh, still yeah. you're still tapping into whatever that is that people see apparently. I, I do <laughs> let a lot of stream of consciousness take control and I do let my dreams bleed into it. And, yeah. you know, if, if I'm drawing and somebody whispers something in my ear, then that's gonna somehow get in there too. Like, it's just right. kind of how, you know, you don't really have control over it. Um, and so the lettering there for what is the plural of moose that was um, inspired by this uh, uh, illustrator, painter, typographer, letterer named Ben Shun, um, who did a lot of really cool hand done lettering. And you'll see like these strips were done in order. Like the first strip is the first one I did. The second one was the second one I did. And you'll see, I just keep trying to experiment and one up myself. And so like this lettering is kind of crude compared to what you, what it gets to further and further into the book, because I just keep trying, Oh, what if I did it this way? What if I tried this out? And yeah. Um, so it just yeah, becomes you, more involved. Right. That's, I mean, that's, that, that's a pretty common thing where people start the issue or the run and, you know, they're still working everything out and, and trying to figure out how it's right. going to be. And then it's like, you know, by the time you get, it's like when I first did lost angels, like I've, I finally knew how to draw the character when I drew the very last page, you know, it's like, Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> only, only 200 pages in. Anything like, um, did you go back and change anything or did you just kind of like, ah, whatever? No, there's no looking back in comics. No, there's not. You're right. You're right. Otherwise, you just spin your wheels forever. No, you and don't remake You're talking anything. about. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I love how you're like introduced to this character. He's this very dark looking, almost like executioner with the, axe looking guy but he's got these like you know boxers or something on underneath his loincloth yeah. so you're yeah. like it and then like what's the plural of moose it like it gets really silly you know also so it's lighthearted and dark at the same time like it's i just think it's just trying to figure out what the plural of moose is and thinking to himself like right you know, like, what so those pages there uh definitely inspired by animation where the figure is moving, but it's the same background painting. Yeah. Uh, just repeated. And oh, mm -hmm. that one is done here. Uh, you see this here. Wow. So that's so a I physical did, it's painting. On, yeah. It's on brown packing paper. And then I, I made the sky yellow on the computer, but yeah, Wild. there's, there was source material there. And, oh, that's uh that guy is one of my favorite, um, physical drawings from the whole thing. So this was some um, white paint and all the stuff on brown paper. Oh, cool. And I quickly yeah. learned that this is a huge waste of white paint. And so if I ever wanted to do it again, I would just do the white paint part digitally. But- uh, <laughs> Well, you cut it out. You could happy. have left it as a texture, but it didn't work for your design element, so. That's right. I don't want to get rid of those. Yeah. Oh, and so like that bunny ears thing somewhere here, I got a stack of pages where I just wrote the words bunny ears over and over and over again, like a crazy person. And um, my yeah, wife came home from work one day and just tons of papers <laughs> saying bunny ears. <laughs> You couldn't get enough of typography stuff. at work. You had to come home and write bunny ears. I mean, did you get in trouble? And, and and your wife was like, no, that's it. As punishment, you're going to write bunny ears 700 times. <laughs> that's right, yeah. So you just did it in different styles to keep yourself from getting bored, huh? <laughs> oh, man, I wish I'd thought of that as a kid when I had to write the same thing over right? and over again. <laughs> Just write it in a different way every time. You know how much further along you would be in your career if you had done that? <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Um, really good practice. I love this but ship to talk too. About, it's just it's just like straight up shapes. It feels yeah. like it's like very Terry Gilliam, you know. Like I feel oh, like I'll it's it. pl it's like pasted on there. Yeah, it kind of is. Like I really, uh, I think I only drew the ship once or twice in the whole book. I love that. <laughs> I thought of it as like um, Snoopy's doghouse. You know, like it only has 
yeah. to exist in 2D space. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really matter. There's only one other angle where it's shown from the top view, just one time, one okay. panel. Otherwise, it's always the same shot of the same ship. Jeez. I'm just in awe of your graphic design sense because I just don't understand it, you know, like. I got I, lucky when with it comes to wiggly figure, like, I, I'll, I'll dance circles around you. But when it comes to graphic design, <laughs> man. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're definitely uh, way more of a, a draftsman than I'll, than I'll ever be. So I got to hide behind all these tricks, you know? Uh, <laughs> That's not what I would say either. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I got, I got lucky with graphic design because like I didn't really know what it was when I started studying it. Like I just, mm -hmm. it sounded like a real job. I liked to draw and I didn't know what graphic design was. And then it just, I lucked out because it happened to be something I really enjoyed doing and uh, got really passionate about. And uh, anytime I'd have a class and learn a new skill, I'd always think, oh, I'm gonna use this in comics one day. And um, finally uh, at that point. And uh, the whole, all, so his internal dialogue is all just typeset and courier. Yeah. Uh, you know, the courier font, mm -hmm. that like typewriter font. And yeah, yeah. part of why was because I thought the lettering in Dishoom 2 is one of the most laborious things ever. Like, I, I enjoy it, but it just took so long. And I thought there had to be a way to streamline it. And so um, I thought, well, Did if you I can. Hand lettered all? Uh, hand lettered oh. digitally. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, like, yeah. what happened? Like there's a lot of pen tool and brush tool. And, and so then I thought, well, if I can type the text, I'll save a ton of time, but I hate the look. Like I'm sure you've seen comics where they have typed lettering and it just looks bad. Mm -hmm. Like it takes you out of the book. Like it doesn't feel like dialogue. It doesn't feel the way mm -hmm. it's supposed to feel. Yeah, I'm struggling with uh, that right it now. It loses that human project. Sorry? I'm struggling with that right now for my new project. I. I'm having a hard time figuring out how the lettering is supposed to be. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you should, you should, uh, you should experiment with just typing it too. I mean, there, there's ways to make it work. I, I think yeah. as long as it's appropriate for the story or the, for the character that it's pertaining to. And so like, um, one of the many, many, uh, uh, sources of inspiration behind the Pariah character was, uh, in many ways, he was my reaction to Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian. And, okay. um, uh, I always, you know, reading those old Howard stories, I, I picture it uh, on like typewritten paper. And uh, so I just thought like, oh, that will be the device. And like when you see it presented that way for his internal dialogue, it it almost affects the voice you read it with in, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And, uh, and so that's where that came from. It, was, it started as like a, a way to save time, but also like it had to fit the character properly. And uh, oh, this dagger of Erebos thing. So yeah, one of the one of the things is he goes after all these like different Holy Grail items that he has to um, amass. He's kind of like a collector, uh, sure. this thief pariah. And um, so the lettering there that was custom lettering done in Illustrator. And I uh, <laughs> I was originally going to call it the dagger of Set, you know, after the Egyptian god Set. And then yeah. I thankfully Googled it before I did that because the dagger of set was the MacGuffin in the Tom Cruise mummy movie. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to do that. No. So, so then I, I looked up other gods of shadows and darkness and I eventually came across Erebos. And then what's cool is this story takes place on Mars and there is a crater on Mars named after Erebos. And so if you go back to that page with the lettering, um, there's a shape, an abstract shape behind it. See like that yeah. indentation? That's yeah. the that's the crater on Mars. Dude, I'm telling you, this is what I'm talking about. When you listen to, you know, the 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 little things just floating around, you know, you're connecting them right. in there for a reason. Maybe exactly. you, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Stuff. It's it's this is that's sort of what happened with, with um, Spectral when when David and I did Spectral. We always talk about how it told us what it was going to be. Yeah, we didn't totally. set out to make this. It told us because it was just like circumstances and happenstance and serendipity that led to like the creation of this book. 
yeah, sometimes that's 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 crazy. Like right? you set out to make something, and then it told you what to make it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's yep. Really listen. Wild. Listen to it. <laughs> and I love how these guys come out of the shadow here, like. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a caption on an earlier page. You don't have to flip back to it, but um, it's like a throwaway line uh, where it it kind of alludes to ancient aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, like the TV and the problem show? with the whole, not specifically the TV show, oh, okay. but just the concept of ancient okay. aliens, which, which never sat well with me because like it's for the most part, it's um, it tends to be something that they do to discredit certain, you know, indigenous people, uh, Asian people, uh, African people. And it's like, oh, no, 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 they didn't come up with this thing. It was aliens right. that did it because they right. couldn't do it. And, sure. uh, you know, that always bugged me. Uh, and so like here there's ancient aliens, but and it's just a throwaway line, blink and you miss it. But it implies that these ancient aliens visited Earth, saw the pyramids, saw like the gates in, in Japan and like just copied all of our stuff yeah. on Earth. Yeah. This is the opposite. And, uh, so that's why you have this pyramid on Mars and everything. It's, it was them being inspired by Earthlings. <laughs> and so that's why there are ninjas on Mars. They didn't originate on Mars. They originated yeah. on Earth. And they thought, hey, ninjas are cool. Let's be ninjas back home. Oh, my God. I love it. It's so This book is so funny and tongue-in-cheek. Like That's why I don't want to like read it all the way through. I want people to discover it. you know. And I think just looking at this you know, will will pique people's interest to pick it up because oh and then you just go into like this, this this lettering where you just sort of like wrote it on a piece of paper i think this was a failed experiment and then i like i don't as know the book goes on it i fine-tune it. it it i just had to find my footing so like what i did was i wrote on lined notebook paper and then mm -hmm. i put tracing paper on top of it and then inked the letters yeah. on the tracing paper. Then I took the tracing paper, put it on white copier paper, photographed it. And then that's what you get here. Uh, I just wish I worked a little larger and then I think it would have come out okay. a little more clear, but so you'll see like later on in the book, like it doesn't, uh, it gets more legible, but, uh, but yeah, I alien. wanted the dialogue. They are alien. And I wanted the dialogue to, to feel organic because all of his internal dialogue is, um, is typed. typed. Right. And yeah. also, he, he doesn't have a mouth. Part of the character design It's worth noting. He doesn't have a mouth and he never speaks. Not one word in this whole book. Everything okay. is just his thoughts. The only reason he's able to have a conversation with these Martian ninjas is because they're communicating telepathically. They're reading his mind. Ah. <laughs> I love this part where he can just like, they're like, yeah, it's, you know, t take it, whatever. That's not what's important to us, so, you know. And he just like, all right, whatever. Malt is out with all the treasure. He's, he's very uh, shallow and materialistic. So, And then you take kind of a left turn here. So let me ask yeah. you this. This also was with it in the in the package. So this, yeah. were you originally going to just sort of release them as like these little minis like this? I was. And then I found out it just was not cost effective at all because of the page yeah. count. And yeah. And so like, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable selling it because it's such a short book and like half of it is ads. And so it's like, even though in my head, I would love for it to be that CD booklet size and just have like uh, 16 different little booklets like that, uh, it just wasn't cost effective. So I did do the one to kind of use as like a business card. And so like, if anybody buys Dishoom one and two, chances are I'll throw in one of those two to maybe entice them to check out the full collection of strips. Yeah, but, uh, super rare uh, collectors edition. For now, yeah, right. For now, it's just like kind of a little uh, giveaway. Um, but you and, do take uh, a left turn here and mm -hmm. it, it, it winds up like back on earth, like in cryptozoology land here. Yes. Beautiful title page by the way looks like a children's oh, thanks. book oh thanks yeah um on the previous page the the drawing of that moth was uh very inspired by uh eric carl a very eric hungry carl, caterpillar right. yeah. so uh uh yeah definitely some children's book uh influence here for sure and then you go to like this you know couple out on you know point <laughs> point pleasant west virginia and you know they spot this thing and 
right. it's like a Mothman story. Exactly. Yeah. So that was one of the first stories I came up with for the pariah character back when I was uh, in college. I just always thought like, yeah, and then he's going to get mistaken for Mothman. Like, I, yeah. I don't know why that was so important to me, but it was. And uh, so even though the, the episodes are numbered, uh, that's really just for the sake of organization. They're not necessarily chronological. Right, right, uh, right, right. So any individual episode can stand on its own, uh, but some episodes are multi-part and then they do okay. need uh, the full set. Gotcha. Now you're getting into a story of that takes place in uh, my old, my original neck of the woods. Paul Bunyan's axe. He's got every kind of axe that you can imagine here, including a Brian May's guitar from Queen. Yeah, is that what that is? Yeah, that's what that is. Yeah, yeah. So like, what? That. That's why it sounds so unique. Oh, it's so crazy. It's so crazy. He made it at age 16, and he's still using it now. I know. And uh, what happened, I, I was doing that page and my wife was walking by and I, I don't even think I got to the guitar part of it yet. I was just drawing the pariah figure and she's like, oh, uh, he looks like a rock star there. And I'm like, oh, really? And so then like, just because this is the kind of thing I'm talking about where it's like if you whisper in my ear while I'm working. So she said mm -hmm. rock star and then I immediately put on those little wristbands that Freddie Mercury wore in some concert. And it's like there now he's a he's a rock star just because she yeah. said so. And, totally. Uh, yeah, the Paul Bunyan's axe that was hand lettered again on notebook paper, Beautiful. and then I put tracing paper on top, and there I figured it out. There I figured out how to do it. <laughs> yeah, and I love how you can just faintly see through it too. Yeah, that's just Photoshop. Because <laughs> it's like yeah, if you spend all that time doing the painting, you don't want to just paint over it with the letters, yeah. you know. I'm from Minnesota and like up north there's a big that's you know, it's in famously in Fargo, like the big Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox yeah. sculpture there. Oh, that's wild. <laughs> um, so he just gave you flashbacks from home. Yeah. So, yeah, he goes to find Paul Bunyan's axe. Like, yeah. just it's completely, seemingly random. So here's Part the ship going through space again. Yeah, and, like, that little narration caption on the left page is, like, me trying to do that poetic Robert E. Howard type of uh, uh, setting the scene. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I feel like it belongs in quotes whenever I say poetry, but uh, um, uh, that's what I was going for there. Uh, because like, like you said about the character design, right? Like the character design looks kind of dark and like looks kind of serious, but then it gets undercut by the plaid shorts uh, or yeah. like, or his internal thoughts. And so it's like kind of the same thing here where it's like, let me set the scene with like this flowery language. And then like, it kind of ends on like a dumb note there. Like that, that second page on the right kind of ends yeah. on a, a silly note where the, the ship literally farts when it runs out of uh, yeah. fuel here. I'm not above potty humor. So, mm -hmm. and there's, is. Never that's the be. only time you'll see the ship drawn at a different angle, like a different view. I love it. I can totally see this as like a, <clears throat> you know, like a Gilliam animation. I hadn't Gilliam thought about that, but that's say. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you should you should do it. You should put <laughs> to put together some ads, you know, for this. Well, actually, so to, when I when I announced the book, I did do a, a minute long animation based on uh, all the images in the book. And uh, I did the, the audio editing for it too by recording my microwave and uh, recording things with my mouth and, you know, <laughs> and just making Where weird sound it? effects. I oh, it's on that. Instagram. I'll, I'll send you a link. Um, it's it was a lot of fun. I spent a whole day on it, uh, and it was it's was like one of the most fun things. And like you know you know like people say like um, they're like writing for the trades. You know like to to. Um, yeah, they're yeah, waiting yeah, for the book yeah. to be all collected in one go. There's a lot of sequences in this book where I was drawing it knowing like, oh, I could use this for animation later. And <laughs> yeah. so like that, that scene where he's walking towards the camera and thinking about the plural of moose, I'm like, this will be a walk cycle in uh, animation. And so that happens a few times. Maybe uh, and I have some that I didn't write here.
<laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> if you want to take the time to edit it, I would be thrilled to to have yeah. it in there because I put a lot of work into it and I don't think a lot of people have seen it. Yeah, it's it won't be that hard to pop pop it in. Cool. Oh my god. Uh I don't know how much like how much to expound on or how much to just let sit there on its own, but yeah, I mean um, just these great beats and these great moments. You know, I like I just like I said I don't want to give the whole thing away to people because I want people to right. buy it and pick it up. So the story, uh, the previous one with the full moon and all that, you don't have to yeah. flip back to it, it's fine, but there's the well, story of the full moon. Um, it, it was uh, kind of uh, autobiographical. Okay. Which, yeah, which I know like people have trouble with or think I'm kidding because it's this muscular rabbit man with no mouth <laughs> who mean? has a spaceship. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like uh, looking in a mirror, but uh, uh, yeah, like it's a uh, kind of an abstract abstract version of uh, autobiography but there there are elements in there and that one in particular uh was about some some interesting stuff so like there's without really going to specifics there was a crime that uh that this pariah character uh committed and then later on he ends up feeling remorse for it and uh so what had happened in real life was one of my young nephews got hold of my phone and saw a violent image from this book and like it kind of shook him up and uh -huh. I felt really bad about it. And so it was me dealing with my own guilt for drawing that violent act. So Pariah feels the guilt for committing the act and I feel the guilt for drawing it. Got it. So yeah, <laughs> it was a whole thing. I mean, I, I never said it was an all like the run or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I didn't commit a crime, but uh, I did draw a person hurting somebody else. So. Oh my God, this bird is great. Oh, thanks. It was oh. uh, the inspiration there was uh, those um, prehistoric terror birds, you know, those super yes. tall, vicious, yeah. flightless birds, mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, roosters in Hawaii who are also yeah. vicious, but thankfully much yeah. smaller. They'll mess you up like a cassowary <laughs> or something. And I love this this type too, this font. Thanks. Yeah, that's Seven. more custom lettering. I whenever yeah. it's those things, I don't use fonts. I just um, I make those letter forms on my own, either by hand or on the computer. I think that one was done in Illustrator. You're you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Can't argue. <laughs> oh wait, go back one page. Okay. Um, yes. So that um, there's a sequence where um, the bird is running away. And like you see his uh, prize body language, so that is clearly something that's supposed to be animated one day. But I did not, uh, I did not put that in my uh, video yet. So maybe that's something I'll do down the line. Like the like the the waft of the air of him running away pulled him forward, kind of deal. Well, it's just kind of this like he was talking to this bird and it runs away on him, and he's like, like oh. <laughs> "Oh, I see his hands up, right?" Yeah, oh, that's great. <laughs> he's got these so these like shorts and the socks and like what is <laughs> it's it's all funny but you know what's even funnier or maybe sadder is how much time i spent planning that outfit <laughs> <laughs> i i would this is like i would be up late on my phone laying in bed not able to sleep and just writing all these different combinations like okay well red plaid shorts with a green loincloth but maybe like yellow socks and like all these different things <laughs> My Until God. I finally landed on this one. <laughs> you really are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> this this like a... elephant God is just like so creepy. I love it. Oh, this okay, feels thanks. like very Frazetta esque, you know, in this, this painting, especially. Oh yeah. That's definitely what I was going for. So I'm glad that mm -hmm. came through. Right down to how Frazetta like was so good at making the feet disappear and you yes, get. Yes, I was gonna say. So I thought, I, as you were talking, I was like, I'm gonna look and see if he drew feet. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it, it took effort to not draw. Like I think I drew his feet in and then painted them out because I didn't know how to make that work the way he did. And like yeah, the it reason disappears into the mist. 
yeah crawling across the ground also just don't have to draw feet then right well it's not even that it's not even like the challenge of it it's more more like the the philosophy behind why Frazetta didn't draw feet because obviously he could yes uh the reason he didn't was because uh it ruined the the flow of action because yeah. it's going to be uh in a perpendicular direction from the line made from the legs and you have right. this like graceful line from the legs and then the feet just ruin it so yep. he would just hide the feet completely in so many paintings and uh i thought wow yeah there's really something to that so I wanted to experiment with that. This drawing here, is this uh, of the elephant back here, is this done in uh, Illustrator or? That one, um, I think it's just Photoshop. I think almost all of the um, grunge graphic design stuff was just straight Photoshop. So really? like what happened, each, each strip is four story pages and a cover. And so I realized if I'm collecting them in a book, I need a filler page on the left of every yeah. cover. And yeah. so then I went back like probably halfway through and then uh, just started knocking out all of the um, grunge graphic design pages as quickly as I could um, because the spontaneity was part of why they work. Um, so like I got is just like anything else, like I'm going to turn that weakness into a selling point. Like, oh, I don't have a lot of time to get these pages together. So let me make them fast on purpose. And uh, so that's what you get there. I love it. And the textures, like the sources of those textures, like um, so even though it's all being composited in Photoshop, uh, there is a lot of hand done stuff or photography creeping in. So I think some of the textures are a little flex. Um, I learned how to bake chocolate chip cookies. I did that for the first time and then I flipped them over and I took pictures of them. And uh -huh. uh, so some of that is cookie texture. And okay. uh, I, also, I also used our baking sheet. I took photos of our baking sheet and those are textures layered on some of these pages. And uh, yeah, sometimes like, like, you know, I'll be walking and uh, the sidewalk catches my eye and then that works its way into the book too. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, so David Acampo, who I did uh, two books with, I did uh, Lost Angels and Spectre with, he's also a graphic designer. He did the graphic design for um, uh, Chaotic Neutral as well. And he nice. talks about how he like like finds, you know, collects textures from all over the place and it'll pop them in. Cause you never know where, you know, you could possibly use them. Totally. Yeah. I think you were, I don't remember where I heard you talking about it, but you were talking about the cover for chaotic neutral with like all the staining on there and it getting mm -hmm. mistaken for like, Oh, someone spilled coffee on my book. Can I get a new one? And, yeah. uh, but I, I love uh, the way he handled that cover. It's really yeah. got that aged. Uh, this was like sitting in someone's basement for a couple decades kind of look to it. Yeah. He pulled it off. It that's well. for sure. I mean, he was really fooling people. He even, it even fools me sometimes when I'll pick up one and I'll be like, oh, this has got something on it. And then I'll like pull it out of the package. And then the one behind it has it in the exact same spot. I'm like, oh, got me again. <laughs> That's always good. So for the, for the elephant god or monster or whatever he yeah. is, I yeah. was just, Prisoner. this is how rudimentary these were. Um, this is just green yeah, colored means. pencil on copier paper, drawing them as quickly as I could could some of them were elephant inspired some are mammoth inspired and like i probably drew a dozen of them knowing that like more than half won't ever be used uh yeah. it was just like let me do a dozen and then pick my favorites and throw them in the book because part of without really giving anything away part of the thing is this being whatever he is is kind of amorphous and doesn't yeah he's not really something you can pin down in physical reality uh, exactly and so i wanted him to look a little off and a little different every time so he's not on model sure. really yeah. yeah this is great thanks and i love this like digital phase out that he does you know it's really hard to 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 nail something like that and make it look like it works with the art i think if this was traditional ink and and ink and pencil and co coloring this this like these like flares wouldn't have worked nearly as well as they do with the you know painterly stuff that you did there maybe someone could with an airbrush but i certainly couldn't i, I definitely relied on photoshop there and so like again going to the animation like i, I painted the background first because that had to be consistent for all three yep. panels. And then um, 
I don't remember what order I did them in, but whatever. It's the same this background. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of pops and poofs and like very um, basic, uh, classic uh, sound effects. I don't uh, overthink those too much. Yeah. Um, so, ugh, the awkward pose. Panel. The awkward pose there. That that's um. So just like the crouch on the very first page of the book, um, mm -hmm. that was uh, both uh, poses were lifted from William Blake. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, and and they're Where both very crouch? awkward. They're both very very awkward. Yeah, that one there on the left. So both of them are pretty awkward poses, um, but they were <laughs> lifted from uh, Blake paintings. Interesting. And blast off, Arabata, yeah. off to space. Right. And then, yeah. is that your original drawing? That was the first ever drawing of that character. And it was just for me to like problem solve back when yeah. I was 19 or 20. And so uh, I didn't even bother finishing it. <laughs> you know, it was just like, okay, well, I know what the rest of the leg's going to look like. So I forget. But right. he's um, since gone through changes. Like he, there he's got like weird almost ninja turtle hands now he's got five fingers like a person mm -hmm. and um he doesn't have those weird hoof feet anymore he's got normal right. feet um and his ears got a little longer a little floppier um, sure and his build changed a bit but you know it's still a weird mouthless muscular figure with long ears and visible underwear <laughs> and an axe in his hand yeah so, the bare bones oh, are still God. there just what a great package. And then, you know, there's your ad. So um, here, <laughs> we can tell people where to find all your stuff is etsy.com slash shop slash Sam J. Sam J. Royale. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and your Instagram and Facebook are also Sam J. Royale. Man. Yep. Pretty that much. That was just really, really cool to look at. I, I just Thanks love your style and I just was so pleasantly surprised when all of a sudden a new Sam J. Royale book popped into the world out of nowhere. So. Oh, thanks. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, was, uh, that was kind of lucky too. Cause like that was, uh, there was overlap. I was working on Dishoom 2 and I was getting frustrated. And so to take a break from it, I got started on Pariah. And nice. then I ended up doing 30 pages for Pariah and thought, oh yeah, I got to still finish Dishoom 2. And so I put it aside. And so. That's how that was able. To I work see out. a lot of super pro in this book. Do you really? <laughs> no, I don't see any super pro in this book. But, <laughs> but you know, the, the thing is, I have enough notes and scripts for another two entire pariah collections that who knows when I'll get the time to do it. And in those, there actually is going to be some overt super pro that you might be able to find if you look closely. <laughs> Quit your job, get to work on it right now. <laughs> I'm on it. Well, thanks for coming on again, man. I really appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me. Really, yeah, of really course. And, uh, you know, when Pariah 2 comes out, we'll talk again. Sounds good. All right. Take care, man. Thanks, you too. Join my Patreon to see my work before anyone else. Plus, score physical sketchbooks, mini comics, and commission delivered right to your door. And read in my new books, Something Seems Off and Three Headed Pigman, as they are made. Go to my website to order original art, commissions, and my books, Lost Angels, Spectral A Showcase of Fear, Chaotic Neutral, and more. Gray Matter Drip, The Art of Chris Anderson, is available now from Cosmic Lion Productions. Here are the upcoming conventions I'll be at at the time of this recording. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. It helps spread the word. Thanks.